Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready, we can uh, start our afternoon session here. It's my great privilege to introduce uh, Christopher Murphy. Uh, Brother Murphy is uh, the Charter Junior Warden of Fibonacci Lodge Number 112, the first observant lodge chartered by the Grand Lodge of Vermont. He's a member of Vermont Lodge Research Number 110 and the Philalethes Society. And he's going to present his paper, The, Tathern Myth, the Tavern Myth, Reassessing uh, Early Lodge Culture. So let's give a hand to Christopher Murphy. Good afternoon. Right, worshipful sirs, worshipful sirs, brethren and guests. Um, first of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, Right Worshipful Grandmaster Raymond Dietz and his Grand Lodge for putting on such a spectacular event. And of course, my thanks to, uh, to the Committee for the Academy as well for extending the opportunity. So thank you so much. This has been a great day so far. <clears throat> so, brethren, there is a minimalist notion existing within the zeitgeist of our fraternity. And it tells us that early Freemasonry uh, was comprised of nothing but um, supper clubs or drinking clubs or mutual aid societies and nothing more. It tells us that early lodges had no philosophy, beyond perhaps the basic moral code. It tells us that the mysteries of Freemasonry refer only to the operative Masons' vocational tricks of the trade, and that the only secrets are those modes of recognition. Or worse, that the only secret is there are no secrets. Now, with all brotherly love and respect, it has to be stated that these assertions are wrong. Now, the brother who tells you these things may justify his assertions with a sort of open-ended, well, they used to meet in taverns, as if nothing else needs to be said on the matter. Now, to be sure, brethren, <clears throat> excuse me, I do not dispute that early lodges met in taverns. They certainly did. Taverns were the civic and social centers of many colonial and European villages and cities, and it therefore makes perfect sense that lodges would meet in these establishments, and in fact, we have volumes of lodge minutes that prove as such. But... Meeting in taverns no more made early Freemasons drunkards than meeting in gardens would have made them vegetarians. And that is because the setting does not determine the work. But yet, one could be forgiven for having this misunderstanding. Um, you know, the, the comparison of, of taverns then to the corner bar today might create that confusion, and indeed it is not new confusion. For instance, uh, this idea caused our brother James Galloway to comment in 1768, besides, our meetings at the houses of publicians gives us the air of a bacchanalian society, instead of that appearance of gravity and wisdom which our order justly requires. Now, because of the, the rationale behind this assertion, the whole, they used to meet in taverns, I have dubbed this fallacy the tavern myth. But, rather than being seen as a denial of the location of early Masonic meetings, it should be seen as describing an overarching theme of minimization and denial of what our early forebears did when in lodge assembled. Now, we are incredibly fortunate, brethren, to live in a time when we have access to early Masonic writings that one might be able to argue unrivals any other time. Uh, we heard both of our speakers this morning speak of the importance uh, of archiving that information and then accessing that information. And thanks to the, the, not only those efforts, uh, but larger scale efforts such as those of Google Books and Archive.org and Gale Echo, we have fantastic access to those early Masonic writings. And I'm talking the early 1700s here. <clears throat> In fact, this abundance of information is so great that it prompted our brother Robert Davis to recently write that there is now no good reason for a Mason today not to know what is true and what is not true about our historical roots. And so, as we begin to uh, dismantle, to deconstruct this tavern myth, we'll be doing so by examining three different classes or categories of early Masonic writings. First are the very clearly articulated expectations of, law, of conduct when in lodge assembled. The second will be the very clearly delineated practice of labor from refreshment. And lastly, and the bulk of the, the talk, will be about those early philosophic and, and even religious and spiritual writings of the early Grand Lodge era. And I will say that I'm going to limit today's uh, conversation to Grand Lodge era Freemasonry itself. Um, certainly prior to 1717, there was a form of speculative masonry that we would recognize today. But uh, for reasons that I'll explain when we get to that particular point in, in the conversation, um, we're just going to keep it to 1717 forward, and, and in fact, keeping it to 1717 to about 1780 or so. <clears throat> and so, 
when 1717 came around and those four lodges met in London with the idea of forming a Grand Lodge, it was done uh, for a few reasons. It was done uh, with this idea of restoring the practice of having an annual feast for Masons. And there was also conversation about sort of regulating the craft workings. And now there had been a practice in Masonry prior to 1717 of, of compiling a list of expectations for Masons. Um, these are known to us today as the Old Charges or the Gothic Constitutions. And so the rulers of what became known as the Grand Lodge thought that they really ought to do that as well. And so they, they brought on a Mason, a Mason by the name of James Anderson, who was a Scottish Presbyterian minister, and they told Brother Anderson to compile this new book of, of Constitutions. And the result was what is known as the 1723 Constitutions of the Freemasons, or Anderson's Constitutions. And Brother Anderson followed the model that had been set forth in all those various books of, of Gothic constitutions. In that, he started with a list of expectations. I'm sorry, he included a list of expectations. He also had a telling of what is known as the traditional history, which we will spend a lot of time with today, uh, and also a collection of songs. So when it came time for Brother Anderson to tell us what the conduct expectation was, he wrote this that when in the lodge while constituted, you are not to hold private committees or separate conversation without leave from the master, nor to talk of anything impertinent or unseemly, nor interrupt the master or wardens or any brother speaking to the master, nor behave yourself ludicrously or jestingly while the lodge is engaged in what is serious and solemn, nor use any unbecoming language upon any pretense whatsoever, but to pay due reverence to your master, wardens, and fellows, and put them to worship." Now, brother, and I would say that this flies directly in the face of what the tavern myth tells us. The tavern myth tells us that there was nothing that would require uh, a serious conduct, that there was nothing serious or solemn happening within these lodges. But here we have these words from Brother Anderson that tell us exactly the opposite. And we know that these are not just the words of one particular mason. For instance, the bylaws of the lodge at Maidshead, which date to 1724, tell us that such expectations were, quote, recommended by our worthy brother, Dr. Desigoulier. Dr. Desigoulier, of course, was the deputy grand master in 1723 um, and would, would go on to become grand master himself. But we don't even need this because we know that Anderson's 1723 constitutions opens with a statement of, of, uh, of praise by Dr. Desigoulier saying that this was a great book. We know that the premier Grand Lodge, after Brother Anderson uh, submitted his first uh, draft of the text, we know that the Grand Lodge appointed a committee of brethren to vet this new book. And we know that the 1723 Constitutions ends with an approbation by the Grand Master. And so we know that this statement, and all the statements within the book, of proper Masonic conduct were, were expected by that Grand Lodge. Now, as a note of the, of the universality of this expectation, we can take a look at how Brother Anderson's words spread. So again, 1723, Brother Anderson's Book of Constitutions. In 1730, Brother John Pennell was brought on by the Grand Lodge of Ireland to compile the Book of Constitution for its Grand Lodge, borrowing exactly from Brother Anderson. In 1734, Brother Benjamin Franklin reprinted Anderson's 1723 Constitutions for the use of the Brethren in North America. In 1738, Brother Anderson came out with his second book of constitutions, which was subsequently adopted by the Grand Lodge of Ireland. And finally, in 1740, the Grand Lodge of Scotland adopted the 1735 Pocket Companion for Freemasons as its de facto book of constitutions. And therefore, in the first 23 years of the Grand Lodge era, England, Ireland, Scotland, and the colonies of North America all had the same expectation of proper conduct when in lodge assembled. I'm sorry which was uh, to act without being ludicrous or jesting in your conduct. And in fact, we have these expectations of how these spread beyond just these books of constitutions. For instance, in the pseudo-epigraphical letter from Brother Euclid, we are told that when in the lodge, none of them are ill-employed, have transactions unworthy of an honest man or a gentleman, no personal peaks or quarrels, no cursing or swearing, no cruel mockings, no obscene talk, nor ill manners. And we also see how, this, uh, how these practices wove themselves into the ritual of the time. In the 1762 exposure, Jockin and Boaz, we have this line spoken by the master at the opening of a lodge. This lodge is open in the name of the Holy St. John, forbidding all cursing, swearing, or whispering, and all profane discourse whatever. When Brother William Preston addressed the craft in 1769, he reminded us that in all regular meetings of the fraternity, brethren are to behave with due order and decorum. 
and at the Grand Masonic Gala of 1772, these words were spoken. No private committees are to be allowed or separate conversation encouraged. The master and the wardens are not to be interrupted or any brothers speaking to the master. But the brethren are to observe due decorum and under no pretense to use any unbecoming language but pay proper deference and respect to the presiding officers. Now, certainly. There were, there were individual masons, or perhaps entire lodges of masons, who disregarded this, who conducted themselves ludicrously and jestingly. But it has to be noted that these men did so in defiance of the expectations of their lodge and of their grand lodge. And therefore, any contemporary brother choosing to emulate this, per, this particular example of the tavern myth is choosing to emulate that, that petulant brother. So please do keep that in mind. But of course, None of what I just said should be construed as a denial of the festivities enjoyed when brethren, when assembled together. Truly, uh, one should only begin to peruse the volumes of Masonic songs and Masonic toasts to get the sense that brethren have always uh, relished in fellowship with each other. But these times were decidedly separate from the serious and solemn work of the Lodge. Now, the tavern myth mixes these things. It mixes the serious uh, with the playful. All right? It conflates what we call labor and refreshment. This, despite clear, despite clear delineations, rather, between the two practices. <clears throat> For instance, I mentioned songs a little moment ago. Perhaps the oldest Masonic song is this. It's called the Entered Apprentices Song. It's credited to a brother, Matthew Burkhead, and dates to about 1710. And it is, it's appeared in a, in a bunch of different pocket companions and books of constitutions. And when it appeared in Anderson's 1723 constitutions, it did so with this statement, this instruction. To be sung when all grave business is over, and with the master's leave. Now this could be the very earliest documented reference we have between the separation of labor and refreshment, but by no means should this be seen as some sort of innovation by Brother Anderson, uh, because truly we have those pre-1717 records that show us uh, that silence and solemnity was expected. But here we have it given to Masons. Now this delineation was captured two years later in the public realm by the Dublin Weekly Journal. In the June 26, 1725 edition of the Dublin Weekly Journal, we have an article describing a procession by the Grand Lodge and some of its constituent lodges. And it tells us that uh, the men were dressed in their finery, and uh, that they, they marched down the street and went to this, uh, this um, sermon. <clears throat> and afterwards, there was this big party. It describes 120 dishes of meat and wine and, and steins. But it makes very clear that all of this happened after performing the mystical ceremonies of the Grand Lodge, which are held so sacred that they must not be discovered. All right? The tavern myth would have us believe that all this celebrating happened during the mystical ceremonies of the Grand Lodge, concurrent with the mystical ceremonies of the Grand Lodge. And yet here we're told very clearly that all that happened afterwards. Now, in fact, this line between labor and refreshment was so clear that there's some indication that the frivolity of a lodge at rest was not even known uh, very widely. We see an indication of this, for instance, in a song appearing in 1731. This appeared in a book of constitutions for the York Grand Lodge. And the stanza goes, the world is all in darkness, about us they conjecture, but seldom think a song and drink succeeds the Mason's lecture. This is telling us that very few people perhaps even knew that that frivolity, those feasts took place after the serious and solemn work of a lodge. But minimally, here we have another example of those two things being separate and apart from each other. And finally, uh, all th this practice was beautifully summed up by Brother Thomas Dunkerley, the right worshipful provisional Grand Master of Hampshire, when he addressed the craft in 1769. To subdue the passions, and improve in useful scientific knowledge, to instruct younger brethren, and initiate the unenlightened, are the principal duties of the Lodge, which when done, and the word of God is closed, we indulge with a song and cheerful glass, still answering the same decency and regularity with strict attention to the golden mean. Now, brethren, as I understand this is being streamed live on YouTube, I won't go into the specifics uh, of some of, this, some of these uh, images, but certainly the Masons in the room can understand when brother, what Brother Dunkerley is speaking of after that colon, which when done and the word of God is closed, we indulge with a song and cheerful glass, therefore marking that distinction between labor and refreshment. So, brethren, I, I hope it's clear at this point what that atmosphere sought was when in Lodge Assembled. One of, one of seriousness and solemnity. But one would ask, to what end? Now, it is the conceit of the tavern myth that there was nothing going on in these early Masonic lodges that could have possibly required silence and solemnity. There was nothing important happening in Freemasonry at that time that could have possibly required 
or inspired philosophical thought or reflection or spiritual looking inward. This despite pages and pages and pages of very clearly articulated philosophic intent to early Masonic workings. So, uh, a bit of a disclaimer before I go further. <clears throat> Much of what I'm about to discuss with you reflects a decidedly Judeo-Christian worldview. In fact, with some explicitly Christian references. Now, none of this should be construed as a statement that only Christianity is compatible with Freemasonry, or indeed a a as an endorsement of any one religion over any other religion. One of uh, Freemasonry's greatest strength, Grand Lodge era Freemasonry's greatest strengths, is its, is its belief in both religious pluralism and religious freedom. And in fact, it stands unique among the world's organizations in that it brings men together under the glory of God without ever making distinctions about which perception of God is correct. But we have to also understand the cultural time and place in which Freemasonry came into full bloom. And so therefore, brethren, I would ask you that any overtly Christian references you are about to hear and see be seen through the lens of a cultural context and not as an endorsement, as I said, of any one religion over any other religion. So... <clears throat> Now, I noted again that um, Brother Anderson, when he wrote his uh, Book of Constitutions, he began it with something called the what we call the traditional history. Now, this is nothing less than the mythology of the craft itself, the self-concept of early Freemasons about where they came from and what they did and what they were there to do. So Brother Anderson's telling of this traditional history begins with these words. Adam, our first parent, created after the image of God, the great architect of the universe, must have had the liberal sciences, particularly geometry, written on his heart. And thus begins this essential myth, with the grand architect creating man with these sacred secrets at his very center. So important was Freemasonry to the, to the history of man and to the destiny of man that the creator took care to place geometry which certainly was synonymous with the craft, with Freemasonry, with the arts and sciences, at his very soul. Now, this line of teaching continues. Again, it starts with Adam, who was careful to teach both of his, both of his surviving sons, but more especially Seth, who had the benefit of having Adam live with him. Seth taught it down the line, eventually unto godly Enoch, who, before he was transposed, still alive to heaven, inscribed the Corpus Masonic onto two pillars, one made to withstand flame, one made to withstand uh, water, so that regardless of the form of the wrath of the grand geometrician, these sacred secrets would be maintained. In other words, according to the traditional history, it was uh, Brother Enoch who was the first one to erect two pillars as an archive to masonry amid, amid conflagration and inundation. From there, the secrets were passed on to Noah, who, as he was building the ark and as he carried the arts and traditions of the antediluvians over the flood, instructed his three sons, Ham, Shem and Japheth. From there, the sacred knowledge was passed on to, of course, Hiram Abiff and ancient King Solomon, and manifested at the building of the Temple of Jerusalem. From there, again, in, in, the, in the Book of Constitutions vetted by the Grand Lodge, from Grand Master Solomon, they went to Pythagoras, to Brother Euclid, to the Egyptian pharaohs, to Julius Caesar, to, I'm sorry, to Alexander, to Julius Caesar, eventually to the kings of Europe and to the rulers of the craft. Other tellings include Hermes Trismegistus, Zoroaster, and the very angels of heaven themselves, all practicing the royal art. Now, all of this, brethren, is to tell us that from its inception, Freemasonry was conceived as a spiritual brotherhood, a philosophic society, descended from the mysteries of antiquity and gathered together to better understand the divine. The Lodge, therefore, was called to order in the ways that we, just, that we talked about earlier so as to facilitate this good and great work. What this traditional history tells us is that Freemasonry was conceived of as a manifestation of those perennialist philosophies, that pure truth given by God in the dawn of man and carried forth as a vein of secret teaching that lasts through the ages. Now again, we had this conversation at dinner a little bit last night. One could ask, did those older, did those 18th century masons really believe that Noah held a lodge aboard an ark? Probably not. No matter what uh, reading of, of, of the, the Old Testament a brother has, whether the brother believes that the Old Testament is the literal God-given truth, or whether a brother believes that the Old Testament is allegory in and of itself, these myths were drawn from that. 
And so regardless of, of an individual brother's particular opinion on the Old Testament, he understood these things to be myth, to be allegory, describing the purpose of Freemasonry as it stood. And this very idea of Freemasonry being gifted by God, it certainly exists in our own lot. As recall, Brother Anderson wrote that Adam was created with geometry at his heart. Now, please don't answer this out loud, but if I was to ask you each where you were first prepared to be a Mason, I think that idea would, would ring some bells, and you would see that it has echoes in even today's workings. But we find these references to the Freemasonry coming from God echoing throughout early 18th century Masonic writing. It appears in catechetical form as early as 1724, when, when it's asked, why was it called Freemasonry? The answer given, first, because a free gift of God to the children of men. Secondly, free from the interruption of infernal spirits. Thirdly, a free union among the brothers of that holy secret to remain forever. So here, we have this reiteration that the craft was given by God. Moreover, it's described as the greater good in that it can keep its votaries free from evil. The knowledge in whole is deemed to be holy. Now these ideas were, were captured with even greater poetry about a decade later in a Masonic charge from Scotland. It reads, O great and holy triune being, whose name is Truth, let error be still absent from us. Make knowledge and virtue our eager pursuits. Grant us wisdom to know thee, and strength to support us in this our spiritual warfare. And open the eye of truth within us, that, discerning thy ineffable beauties, we may be drawn off from the vain and sordid pleasures of this life, to fix our loves on thee, the only fountain of happiness. Now there are some complex themes found in this charge, relating to the spiritual and philosophical underpinnings of our fraternity. It reiterates that, that the craft can keep its votaries free from evil. But there's an urgency in this language, speaking of a spiritual warfare. This tells us, perhaps, that our quest for the greater good is not a guaranteed victory. But with the help of God and the holy brotherhood, perhaps those infernal spirits can be overcome. Interestingly, it also, it also names the creator as truth, and later asks for divine aid in opening the eye of truth within us. This speaks to an early Masonic belief of an inner divinity, this potentiality for each of us to open that eye of the divine, to awaken that spark that, is with, that we are each of us created with at our center. And in fact, the symbolism is present in our, in, in our lodges today, in the symbolism of the ashlars. Uh, it was in the 1750s that, the, that someone first observed that the perfect ashlar is, is uh, I'm sorry, that the smoothing of the rough ashlar into the perfect, perfect ashlar is bringing us into the image of our creator. And it's critical to remember that that smooth ashlar is just resting within the, the uh, rough ashlar, just waiting to be revealed as we get rid of the vices and superfluities of our life, revealing what is already there, that eye of truth within us. Now, we have this understanding, of course, that with the divine within us and with the help of Freemasonry, that is how we can best understand God. And that's not me talking. That's the Grand Lodge of Ireland talking. Because in 1730, they had this prayer as part of their book of constitutions. And we beseech thee, O Lord God, to bless this our present undertaking, and grant that this, our new brother, may dedicate his life to thy service, and be a true and faithful brother among us, and do him with divine wisdom that he may, with the secrets of masonry, be enabled to unfold the mysteries of godliness and Christianity. I'll say that again. With the secrets of masonry, may he be able to unfold the mysteries of godliness and Christianity. It was the early Masonic belief, brethren, that there was something inherent to the craft itself that acted not as a handmaiden to religion, but as a statement of explanation to religion. That certainly every person, man or woman or child, had the capacity to understand God in some way through his or her religion. But it took Freemasonry to unfold those mysteries of godliness and Christianity. And it wasn't just the Grand Lodge of Ireland who taught that. A Masonic writer in 1738 wrote us that the secret of Freemasonry was the very basis of religion and so greatly conducing to the welfare of mankind as to be even essential for the salvation of their souls. Again, the basis of religion, that, that pure, that prisca theologia that was given to Adam at the dawn of time and carried forth as the craft. And again, because uh, the, the volume of sacred law that was so widely used in the colonies in Europe at the time was the Holy Bible, we also have an example that Freemasonry was seen as a way to better understand that. For instance, in 1759, we are told that those ancient Masons associated to explain the scriptures, to preserve the knowledge of architecture, and to endeavor to make improvements therein, 
to cultivate brotherly love, friendship, and hospitality, not only between themselves, but also to study how to be useful and beneficial to mankind in general. This sacred rite, or custom as they term it, is still kept up among them. So here we have the, these, these utterances of, it takes masonry to understand the divine. The, uh, that masonry is the basis of religion. And in fact, that masons gather to explain, not interpret, not sermonize on, but to explain those, scripts, those scriptures. That was the early concept of what Freemasonry was all about. And again, getting back to this idea that it came from God and given to Adam, we find Adam cast as a master mason in a variety of Masonic songs and sermons and in, in the traditional history itself. For instance, this 1756 song, which comes to us from the Heman Raison, the, uh, the book of constitutions for the ancient Grand Lodge, we find this stanza. To rule the day, the Almighty made the sun. To rule the night, he also made the moon. And God like Adam, a master mason free, to rule and teach posterity, sanctity of reason and majesty of thought amongst Freemasons should be sought. So at the time that the great architect is creating our lesser lights, the sun and the moon and the master mason, so Freemasonry itself is coeval with creation. And we have this statement again that it is a manifestation of the perennialist philosophies because Adam was there to rule and teach posterity. He was there to set forth the craft throughout the successive generations. Now, because Adam was cast as a master mason, the story of Adam was then, was then viewed in Masonic terms. And when you think about the story of Adam, one of the, the, the critical uh, occurrences in his story is his fall from grace. And of course, this came to be framed in Masonic terms as well. For instance, in 1737, a Masonic writer said that had it not been for that fatal apple, Adam would have remained the first Freemason. But a Scottish Mason two years earlier put a much finer point on it when he wrote that our first father Adam was left without excuse when he transgressed the divine command. But after his default, the passions usurped the throne of reason. The passions usurped the throne of reasons. Brethren, this hereby creates a highly religious context for the Freemasons' chief duty. Again, we're being streamed, so don't say it out loud, but if I asked what you came here to do, you would find echoes of this statement in there, built right in there. And in fact, uh, it appeared in an exposure as early as 1730 with these words. What do you come here to do? Not to do my own proper will, but to subdue my passions still. So therefore, in this, this narrative of Adam as a Freemason and as his fall from grace being a result of his failure to tame his passions, we can therefore see that duty to subdue my passions and the labor of masonry itself as, as a, uh, a correction of original sin, as a purification of self. And because the Lodge Room is the site of this Masonic labor, it is the Lodge Room that in the eyes of these early Freemasons, it is the Lodge Room that became the site of this Reformation. And as such, it was often described of in sacred terms, either comparing it to the, the Garden of Eden and the paradise, the, the paradise of that, or to the heavenly realms themselves. Uh, a brother by the name of William Smith, writing in 1736, talked about the Masonic initiation in this way, as a purification. And after the candidate was handed the emblem of innocence, then this occurred, this, this realization burdened, that the world now from west to east, from south to north, affords nothing but objects of delight and surprise. Now the mystic gate of paradise is opened, and the tree of life presents itself, and as such as do not transgress the lodge's precept will be admitted to eat the immortal fruit thereof. Now a very quick lesson in, in the book of Genesis, the, it was eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that caused Adam and Eve to be expelled from Eden. And had they not done that, they would have had ready access to the tree of life, which granted immortality. But in the words of this early Masonic writer, that Masonic labor itself was the key to regaining that access to immortality, that access to the purity of self. It was through Masonic labor. Now, sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, uh, the, the, the Almighty placed a, a cherub, an angel, with a flaming sword at the door. And in fact, this idea, this imagery, was used to describe the, sac the secrecy of a tiled lodge room. Again, linking it to Eden. For instance, a 1731 song used the image where cherubs guard the door with flaming swords before. This creates a, another wrinkle to that idea that Freemasonry can keep its votaries free from evil, free from the interruption of infernal spirits. It's with the help of the angelic host itself stationed at our door with a sword, keeping off cowans and eavesdroppers. And so what we then have is that beauty of Eden within the lodge room. 
where sceptered reason from her throne surveys the lodge and makes us one, and harmony's delightful sway forever sheds ambrosial day, where we blessed Eden's pleasure taste while balmy joys are our repast. Now, just as common as being uh, likened to Eden, the lodge room is also likened to heaven itself. Um, a few months ago, uh, Brother Sean Iyer, uh, for those of you who are subscribers to the Phil Lathes Journal, uh, Brother Sean Iyer did a beautiful job annotating uh, a, a 1734 uh, dissertation on Freemasonry. And the 1734 dissertation is special for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's the third oldest Masonic oration that survives. Um, it is the oldest American Masonic oration that survives, and it is the oldest private Masonic oration that survives. Uh, the two that antedate it were done for, for an open crowd, uh, for, for mixed with profane and Mason alike. But the 1734 oration uh, was delivered just to Masons in the sanctity of a tiled space. And that 1734 oration talks about St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Uh, for those of you who aren't, aren't necessarily familiar, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians talks about um, being brought from a, a child to a man and a glimpse into the third heaven. Um, this anonymous writer, writing in 1734, this Mason, told us that what St. Paul was describing was, a, was an initiation, was a Masonic initiation and a glimpse into the celestial lodge above. And all, those ta all that talk about being raised from a, from a boy to a man, glimpsing into the third, the third veil of heaven, was a way for Masons to get Masonic meaning from the Bible itself, casting heaven as the celestial lodge above. And it wasn't just in 1734 in the colonies that that was happening. For instance, in 1756, again from the Ahiman Raison, we have this, uh, this song. Let's lead a good life whilst powers we have, and when that our bodies are laid in the grave, we hope with good conscience to heaven to climb, and give Peter the password, the token, and sign. St. Peter he opens, and so we pass in, to a place that's prepared for all those free from sin, to that heavenly lodge which is tiled most secure, a place that's prepared for all masons that's pure. So here, again, the lodge is likened to Eden, but, I'm sorry, likened to heaven, but we have St. Peter acting as the celestial tiler. And even when the lodge is not being explicitly compared to Eden or to heaven, it was still described in sacred terms. Now, a, a common theme that we even see uh, repeated in many of our monitors today uh, appeared, for instance, in 1727, when it was asked, how stands your lodge, east and west, as kirks and chapels did of old? Why so? Because they were holy, and so we ought. So we ought to be holy. So we ought to be pure in what we were doing, and so ought we carry forth the teaching of the divine to successive generations. These were the beliefs of these early Masons. Now, it's critical to remember a few things about this. First, um, all these sources that we just talked about tonight, all these examples that, 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 that have been shared, um, they came from mainstream Masonic sources of the time, or from prom prominent Masonic leaders of the time. These are from books of constitutions that were given to us by Grand Lodges. These were given to us by the leaders of the craft. These aren't some tinfoil hat-wearing masons. Now, it's also critical to understand that this is not by any means a comprehensive uh, list of these sorts of references. The early Masonic writing abounds with these references. And you can find them in the books of constitutions, in the, in the, the sermons, in the speeches, in the oration, in the Masonic exegeses, in the manuscripts, and in the aid de memoirs. The exposures, you can find it listed throughout all those. And also, it's critical to remember that the men who wrote these words weren't interpreting Freemasonry. They were crafting Freemasonry. They were there at the beginning of Grand Lodge era Freemasonry, and therefore the views and the beliefs that are revealed through these writings constitute the core of Masonic beliefs of the time. These cannot, be, these cannot be cast away for some sort of minimalist view when we see that they abound in the surviving literature of the time. But one might ask, why does any of this matter? Why should Masons of the 21st century be at all concerned with what Masons of the 18th century believed and taught? Well, brethren, it is because that the tavern myth tells us that there was nothing important to Freemasonry then. And we know, as students of speculative architecture, that no building can stand upon a weak foundation. And therefore, we know that by saying there was nothing important to Freemasonry then, we know that means there is nothing important to Freemasonry now. If there is nothing important to Freemasonry now, I would ask you, would there be any reason for us to ponder our symbols, or to learn our lectures, or to, or to confer degrees? Would there be any reason at all to perform the duties of a chair or to attend lodge communications? 
If there was nothing important to Freemasonry now, could we, as, as many grand jurisdictions uh, state, could we possibly partake of the divine nature if there was nothing important to Freemasonry now? And if there is nothing important to Freemasonry now, then what are any of us doing in this room in the first place? Freemasonry has survived in its current form for nearly 300 years, all the while making its votaries wiser, better, and consequently happier. It does this, in part, by illuminating a path of spiritual inspiration. Now, the tavern myth, this minimalist narrative, places a bushel over the light of our craft. But by dispelling the tavern myth, we allow our light to shine among men and among masons. So, brethren, thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you for that, Brother Chris. Another fabulous talk. Well, we'll have a short break while we set up the tables for question and answers, and then uh, you may address your questions to all three of the speakers. Uh, let me also announce that uh, Brother Hairston uh, has some books for sale out uh, in the lobby, and so if you would like to purchase one, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. And it just so happens we not only have the author of the book here, but we also have the editor of the book here, and they're both willing to sign it. So if you'd like to go out and get a copy of Brother Harrison's book, uh, please feel free.
right there. Yeah. So, done. So whoever was sitting there before is sitting there again. This wasn't mine. Yeah, who was fun with this? If the members of the Academy and our speakers would come forward. I guess John is out there signing books. <laughs> While we're waiting for Brother Hairston, I, I, if you have a, a question for Heather or Chris. Yes, sir. Okay. Wait for your microphone, Brother Rich. Uh, Rich Cassera from uh, Westmoreland Lodge 518. I, I have a question for everybody, and I hope when our guest comes, he'll answer it too. 
You folks are in the trenches. Uh, and what I mean by that, you're digging up the history that we're all very much interested in this room. And we're starting to be taken seriously by the academicians uh, across the country and the, and the real historians and our impact as a society on modern thought. And as you're dredging these things up and you're changing the perception of Freemasonry, I just want to know how it's changing you and what you think your impact will be on the whole American experience. <laughs> well, I spoke to it a bit uh, during my, my talk just now uh, about the, the, the universality of religion that rests at the core of Freemasonry. But Freemasonry had its Freemasonry at its soul is, is universal in nature. Uh, it, it regard, with the exception of, of the division uh, between, between sexes, which I'm not at all going to touch, so please don't ask me to, um, with, with, regard to with regard to men, it's, it, it does not make distinctions between uh, race or ethnicity or religion or wealth. And if we look at, at American history, America is often described as, as that melting pot. And I think diversity, by and large, is something that is valued by most Americans. Um, and so, sure, thank you, thank you. So to, ask, to, to answer the question about how Freemasonry can help shape American thought, I think Freemasonry at its core shares that belief in universality. And, and Freemasonry can, be, can once again become a hub of multiculturalism in the nation if we allow ourselves to, if we, if we can look past our own prejudices and our own beliefs and instead embrace craft teaching, I think that is the best way that Freemasonry can help influence American thought. Absolutely. And I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's what comes to mind when, you, when I hear those words you said. So, Dr. Calloway. Brother Harrison, did you hear the question? No, can I hear it one more time, please? <laughs> Brother Rich, can you? Changing American thought. I'm, I, that's a pretty lofty. Uh, okay, and, and uh, yeah, but that you know what I mean. I, I don't even view the book like that. I, this is a great piece of history. Uh, uh, I don't know what impacts the book will have on American thought. I, I can only understand the impact that um, I want it to have on Prince Hall Freemasonry and the research that we do as historians. Uh, uh, that's where I would love the impact to happen. Um, because I think that there are, uh, is so much that needs to be corrected, uh, not just with the uh, Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, but there are other um, instances where histories have to be corrected. In fact, I just did a um, masterpiece paper for the Phylaxis Society called The Reading of the Minutes, which challenges the formation of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and so uh, these are histories that, you know, the records uh, actually have, and we have to uh, honor those. So that's the impact I wanted to have. I want to at least correct the history of Prince Hall. Anything after that is a plus. <laughs> yeah. But I think what Rich is getting at is that there is also a perception of the role that Freemasonry uh, played in the formation of our republic and in formation of the uh, democracies in, in Europe and so forth. And this is an aspect of uh, Freemasonry that has been ignored for a long time historians. And Margaret Jacob, of course, has been one of the people 
a professional historian at uh, UCLA who makes the argument that it was the primary conduit through which the values of the Enlightenment were actually spread throughout America and Western Europe. And I, of course, those enlightened values uh, form the foundation of uh, our American democracy and a, bunch, a number of the European democracies as well. And I think a greater appreciation for that should make people more interested in the sort of things that we're doing because we're keeping the light, we're keeping the torch, we're, we're carrying on the program. And if you folks want to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that Freemasonry has a lot to contribute uh, to thought in general, uh, philosophical thought, esoteric thought. Uh, uh, I, that's why I enjoyed uh, Christopher's presentation so much uh, about the fact that there was a solemnity to uh, Freemasonry, even it, far back as the, the operative lodges. I'm a transitionalist, I believe in the transition theory, and the debate there is whether or not uh, these so-called lodges uh, actually self-reflected, if there was anything of speculative value uh, there. And uh, most of the time when I'm reading a lot of uh, uh, American literature, I find Freemasons at the forefront of uh, shaping the thought of the society. So yeah, I think that Freemasonry uh, holds a responsibility and an obligation to be at the forefront of American thought, yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, back, oh, we have one right here. Hi, I have, uh, Brother Benjamin Littman, uh, Junior Warden of Shiloh McCullough Lodge, number 558. Uh, my question is for Brother Murphy, and I have a, another question for Dr. Calloway. For Brother Murphy, looking at your presentation, uh, someone who's, I have conferred the first and second degree, and I deliver all the charges at my lodge. Everything you said seems to be something that I have given to a candidate that I've gone through, and it seems like those ideas are still very relevant and prevalent in all of our degree work. Um, is there, how did that carry over throughout all, all these years? How did it change as far as different interpretations between the jurisdictions? Well, in terms of, uh, in terms of a history of, of sort of jurisdictional differences, we'll, we'll say that, um, I, I can't really speak to. But what I would say is that the reason why those themes are, are present even today, even if they are a bit masked today, um, is because they are at the core of craft teachings. That Freemasonry, as, as, as I certainly believe, based on uh, some of the examples that I shared today, Freemasonry is based in this, this search to understand the divine and a self-concept that we are descended from the mysteries of antiquity in a, very, in a very real way. And so it's hard to undo those things without losing the identity of Freemasonry itself. Now, why, the, why are they masked and why do they seem unfamiliar to us uh, in today? I think it's because, in general, um, not a lot of masonry is done in a lot of lodges these days. That often uh, we find ourselves and our energies having to go towards facilities management, to public relations, to you know what uh, what kind of light bulb should we get for the back hall, that sort of thing. And the labors of masonry have had to take a back seat. Uh, the labors of masonry often, not universally, but often, have been relegated to lodges of research just for that purpose, or for 10-minute long Masonic education pieces. Um, whereas the, the thrust of Freemasonry at its formation was all about enlightenment, was all about finding that inspiration. And so you can't, you can't have Freemasonry with having some of that at its core. So that's why it sounds familiar to you, I think, Brother Ben. Thank you. And for Dr. Calloway, uh, you were talking about databases and archiving and preserving records. What strategies would you suggest, um, based on your expertise, for lodges and also for grand lodges to implement so that they can keep better records and preserve their uh, histories? Sure. Well, that's a that's huge project. <laughs> um, I always recommend that people come up with some sort of collections policy first. So what that is, is, is it can be very simple, and you can just create a document that says what you collect and what you don't collect. So that can establish what you're going to keep or throw away. So one of my favorite words is deaccession, and it is a real word, 
And I used to um, often tease my boss at the Supreme Council. Um, he didn't think it was a real word, so I brought one of my textbooks to work and showed him. But deaccession is to um, basically get rid of stuff that you have in your collection. Um, museums do it a lot, and they sell the stuff. But libraries do it. At, you know, weeding is deaccession. So um, if you come up with a policy, you can create what your lodge should keep. And you know, local lodges should probably focus on that lodge's history. Um, you don't need every copy of every encyclopedia that's ever been written, um, and every Bible that's been put out that might belong to someone that used to belong to your lodge. Um, so coming up with that and putting it in the policy, I put the Bible thing in there. I, I make lots of jokes about that, but that is the number one gift we receive at every archive I've worked at. And I've worked at religious, and fraternal and higher ed. All three places, um, that's the most given thing that I get through donation. So um, I always kind of put that in there because um, I don't want 300 Bibles sitting on my shelf taking up space. So coming up with a policy, um, also consulting um, people like me. So there's people like me all over the country. So whether you go to your local historical society, whether you go to your local college or university and reach out to them or um, those of us that have Masonic experience. Um, we're all very, very passionate about what we do and very willing to help just have discussions and emails and phone calls about what we do and what's good to save, what's how you, how you save it. Um, because th there are similar people like me, um, we're, we're that into telling other people how to do it yourselves. So. Yeah. Uh, Mike Mochin, East McKeesport Lodge, uh, number 765. Uh, my question is for Brother Murphy. Uh, it's said there, uh, by a lot of authors that deism was introduced by uh, Anderson in, in 1923 with the Constitutions, that it kind of preva prevailed uh, as a regulative you know, principle regarding the great architect of the universe until the Act of Union in 1813. In your opinion, uh, do you accept or reject that, and is it consistent with uh, many of the quotations uh, that you, present, you, you presented in terms of relating uh, religion to you know, Masonic uh, practice? Sure. Uh, thank you, Brother Mike. Um, so I, I, I do not necessarily ascribe to the idea that Brother Anderson introduced deism to the craft. I think the way that Brother Anderson, the words that Brother Anderson used Again, which were which were mimicked by all in all of those other books of constitutions that I, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, the words he used were uh, in the 1723 Constitution uh, was that we should um, leave each man to his own persuasion and denominations, uh, leaving his own particular opinions to himself, uh, so that uh, masonry becomes the center of our union. So it, it's not it, it's not to say that there is not a face to God. It is not to say that there is not a name to God. Merely that Freemasonry was not there to discern which one was true, if one could ever be true. Um, and when you look at the 1738 edition of Constitutions, Brother Anderson goes on further to define that religious, that, yeah, religious universality um, in Old Testament terms, because he says that Masons um, ought to be true Noahites, sons of Noah, and that by believing in the, that if, that if all Masons believed in the three great articles of Noah, that was enough. That was enough to preserve the cement of the lodge. Even then, Anderson is not putting a name or a face or a religion or a sect to religion itself, but he was using Old Testament terminology to define it, which would say to me that that's not deism. It's not Christianity or Judaism, but it's also not deism. Um, what I hold is that that was a very shrewd way of defining universality, because the, what, what the Noahite commandments are are the way for Gentiles to remain uh, righteous in the eyes of God. Um, uh, Jews need to obey, I may have the number wrong, the, the 616 mitzvah of, of, of the Almighty. But the Gentiles, meaning any non-Jew, only has to obey seven of them. Now why Anderson chose, said three great articles of Noah and not seven, I have articles about that. I won't get into that necessarily. But um, what he does is to use a term taken from Judaism to describe all non-Jews, which I think is a very shrewd way of representing religious plurality and religious universality in a way that doesn't necessarily connote deism. I get the excitement of uh, 
having one question from the internet for the whole panel. Question from Brother Chad Haveman of Lonnie Irvin Daylight Lodge, number 1309 in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, his question for the panel as a whole. Knowing that Masonic history is something that is rooted and steeped in the lore of Masonry, as all of the speakers can and have attested to, can the lore of Freemasonry philosophically balance the archival history of Freemasonry? And is there a current imbalance leaning towards the lore that may be the possible cause of the decline of usage and maintenance of the libraries and museums? So I think he's looking at, uh, you know, is there a more interest in the, the physical artifacts per se than the actual history uh, as presented by some others? Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> so uh, I think that, uh, in fact, Albert Mackey wrote in his uh, History of Freemasonry, uh, he made a distinguishment between the legend of Freemasonry and the actual history. And he stated that a lot of scholars and uh, historians from that particular time were taking the legends as being the literal history of Freemasonry. Uh, so, yes, is this a common occurrence where uh, the lore is accepted, the, the beautiful lie is uh, uh, accepted as truth? Yes, uh, I think that that is, is uh, happening. This is the, the work of the historian. This is the wages that we uh, receive when we do our labor, is that we get to discover the truth. We get the true history. And I've always stated that um, the truth is like our mother. It doesn't matter how she looks, we have to accept her. Uh, and so uh, that's the reason why I'm, I'm, even though I found what I found, it doesn't make me uh, any less appreciative of what those brothers did throughout the years and the heritage that has been accumulated uh, by uh, Prince Hall affiliation. So I think that uh, more research has to be done and a, and a greater appreciation for the work of historians and researchers uh, has to be achieved and attained uh, for that imbalance to be corrected. So I think that we can't document the history without saving this stuff. So it's a hard balance because there there's only so much time. There's only so many people doing it. Um, there's only so much money. Our facilities are falling apart. So um, I think people enjoy the myth, um, but then um, hoping that people, um, more people become interested as, as we're doing more research, as digitization is um, becoming more accessible and affordable, um, then we can get the message out there and more research can be done and more stuff can be preserved. You know, and I'm, I'm also struck by the, the use of the term lore because um, I think that can mean a few different things. Uh, you know, lore could mean the actual uh, dates and times history, the actual the academics history. Uh, I suppose lore could also refer to, that's an odd mic, uh, the lore could also refer to um, that traditional history that I spoke to, that, that allegorical history. But then there's also the lore of uh, what I will call speculation as to historical roots. Meaning, you know, did we descend from the Knights Templar? Are we a Rosicrucian society? Are we deemed from alchemists? Like, so, so depending on what the, the, the questioner asks means by lore, I think determines the answer to that question. But I would certainly agree with Dr. Calloway that our material culture is critical to understanding from whence we came. That again, we can have our ideas, you know, our ideals and our beliefs are eternal but the cultural context of where we came from and what those early brethren believed and taught, we would not know were there not some means to archive what they were telling us exactly. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's critical. I like what Dr. Calloway said. Other questions? Well, if not, Brother John, would you like to do the closing? Robert. According to our schedule, we were supposed to close around 3 o'clock. I'll do my best to keep us here that long. <laughs> Last week, I made an official visit to one of the lodges in my district. 
And I'd been talking at the School of Instruction about Masonic education moments, sharing little tidbits of information in open lodge with all the brothers present. Is that better? All right. I'll use my microphone voice then and see if that works. Okay. The Washwell Master was absent that night, and the senior warden, of course, was acting as master. He'd never done it before. He was extremely nervous, but he knew the district deputy was going to be there, and he knew he had to do everything right, including inserting the Masonic education moment. And what he talked about sort of dovetails into some of what the speaker said this, a this afternoon. He said, you know, we open our meetings with a prayer, and in there we speak about the great architect of the universe. And he said, I just started to think, yeah, what, what is this universe? And he said, then I remembered something one of my old college professors had said many years ago. And if, you're, if he's going to repeat that, I'm going to listen because I know no college professor ever says anything wrong or makes a mistake. <clears throat> of course, I never did. <laughs> he said, <clears throat> let's consider the universe and its size and its composition. He said, if you were to go outside on a warm summer's night, lie down in the grass, and look up at the bright sky, and start to count the stars, he said, we all know that's an impossible task. We can't, we can't count all the stars. But if we had some sand, and we made each grain of sand equivalent to one of those stars, we could hold all the stars we see in the sky in the palm of our hand. He said, that's a lot of stars. He said, but we know that we're just one small part of that. We're in a galaxy known as the Milky Way. And if we were to make each star in the Milky Way galaxy equivalent to one grain of sand, we could hold it all in a shoebox. And I'm thinking, yeah, that, that's a lot of sand. He said, but if I were to ask you to make a representation of all the stars in the universe using one grain of sand for each star, what would your results be? And everybody's thinking, you know, what, a barrel, a tanker load? And he said, no, it would be an impossible task because there is not enough sand on this earth to represent all the stars in our universe. And I thought, wow, you know, that, thanks for making me feel so significant. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm less than a speck on one little piece of dust. But then I thought, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean we're hopeless and helpless. There's a lot we can do as individuals, and I, I've seen it in many of the lodges. I've, I've seen it here, particularly by the design of, of Freemasonry. And <clears throat> one of my favorite authors, Joseph Fort Newton said, it is said that Masonry is comprised of a group of religious men. And I think by and large, that's, that's very true. In fact, we have to, swear to that when we are, are admitted to the Lodge. And we should all agree that God works for man through man, and seldom, if at all, in any other way. He asked for our voices to speak the truth, his truth, for hands to do his work here and beyond, sweet voices and clean hands to make the liberty and love prevail and the injustice tarnished and do away with hate. Not of all of us can be learned or famous. Each of us can be loyal and true of heart, 
undefiled by evil, undaunted by error, faithful and helpful to our fellow beings. Life is a capacity for these highest things. Let's make it a pursuit of the highest and eager, incessant quest for truth, nobility, unity, a lofty honor, a wise freedom, a genuine service that through us and the spirit of Freemasonry may grow and be glorified. And I think we need to remember that each and every one of us, we've taken oaths, we've listened to presentations, we certainly have a duty to mankind. And we know that each of us can be the force to lift someone up or the last straw that person can possibly carry. I hope each of us choose to lift. Let us pray. Great architect of the universe, as we prepare to depart from this gathering, may we be thankful for the fellowship that we've enjoyed here today and for the new knowledge we've gained from the programs presented to us at this meeting. Strengthen us to go forth and boldly finish the task we have set for ourselves as a result of this gathering, as well as belonging to this great fraternity. Teach us the importance of duty and the faithfulness to our obligations. Bless those who are serving their country, protecting their fellow man. Keep us safe as we return to our respective homes, that we may have the further opportunity to serve you. O oh Lord our God, bless our wonderful fraternity. Amen. So be. Have a safe trip home, brothers. And, and we'll see you in the spring. <laughs>